to go fast, even if you're still training your model, trying to make it more accurate. Um, we're also going to talk about how to make your model faster when you deploy it. So one of the key ideas here is that talking about speed is not an independent thing. Um, if you're trying to speed up your model, it's always constrained by your hardware. And there's often trade-offs between the speed of your model and the accuracy of your model. So we're going to talk about a lot of these trade-offs today and how you can sort of make decisions around them. Um, and in this scenario, just to be very clear, the hardware refers to your CPU and your GPU constraints. So as a quick recap, you use your model for two different workflows. The first is training, which you're all very familiar with at this point. Um, it involves feeding a large amount of data to the model over and over again. You do a forward pass through the model, you get the outputs, and then you get a loss based on those outputs, and then you do a backward pass through the model to update the weights to improve how the model is doing on the training data. The other workflow is inference. So this is after you've trained the model, um, now you just want to predict on some new data, which may be smaller, more varied. Uh, and in this case, you just have one forward pass. You just send the data through the model and you see what it predicts. Uh, so speed matters for both of these workflows. For training, it matters because if your training takes longer if you're not optimized for speed. Uh, you can, your, your experimentation is slower. You can't run as many comparisons uh, you can't iterate quickly. Um, we've talked about things like hyperparameter selection and comparing models, and these things take longer if your model runs slower than it should. Um, also, things like debugging, like how many people here have, you know, wanted to debug their training scripts, they hit run, and you wait like 30 seconds until it hits the part that you want to debug. So <laughs> we can improve things like that to allow you to develop quicker. Yeah. And it also matters during inference. So at some point, you want to take this model and you want to use it for something. Um, having a model that runs faster on more efficient and cheaper hardware is really important. That kind of, you know, it affects the usability of your model for yourself and for other people. I think especially in this community, like people don't just have $10,000 GPUs that they can run their models on. You have to keep in mind your end use case and the constraints of your hardware after you've done all your development to try to get the best possible accuracy, what's going to make your model actually usable? And a lot of the time that, a lot of the time efficiency is a big part of that. You should also think about um, down the road, are you going to run your model in batch or online? So what that means is uh, in batch would be you have a big batch of data that you want to send through the model and evaluate it all at once. 
So you have a big hard drive of video that comes in and you want to analyze it. Or you want to run your model over the entire Earth, like, or an entire country of satellite imagery. Um, online would be more like you deploy your model out in the field. It runs in real time online as the data is coming in. So you're streaming data one frame at a time. So all, both of these have different effects on how you should design your model for inference. And in all of these, you need to consider the target hardware as well. So a lot of the time, devices out in the field are much lower power. So you might need to run a smaller model, more efficient model to attain real-time speed. And so there's three stages really here, if we go back to the um, training and inference diagram. So the first is the actual data loading step where you have uh, your code is reading data from the disk, so images or videos or TIFFs or whatever. Um, then the second stage is that data actually hits the model. Um, and then after that, you have all your application-specific post-processing. Uh, but these two first stages of data loading and model execution are shared between everybody here. Um, those are also the two biggest bang for the buck um, areas of improvement for model efficiency and speed. Uh, so those are the two that we're going to focus on in this lecture. Um, the first is data loading. The first, what is data loading? I kind of said it in one sentence. It's, your, it's when you read data from the disk. This is actually kind of a compute intensive process. A lot of applications are bottlenecked by this process. Um, it also involves then taking the data that you've read from disk, so an image or a video or something, and transferring it to the GPU. So your data needs to be on the GPU. Your model needs to be on the GPU in order to uh, you know, utilize the GPU for faster model execution. Uh, and the process of moving the data to the GPU is part of data loading, and it's also sometimes a bottleneck. So in this diagram, um, the data loader is this arrow, taking the data to where the model is. And kind of a uh, fun analogy is if you think about your data being all the boxes that you want to move into a new house. Um, the end goal is that all your boxes end up in your new apartment. And in this analogy, you can think of your car as your model. So a smaller car allows you to take less data more quickly to the house, but you can do it faster. Um, a larger model allows you to process more data at once, but slower. Okay, so you're trying to optimize how quickly you can get data through the model and into the outputs. And in this analogy, the data loader is like the moving company that you hire. So you have a bunch of people working for you, loading boxes into your car. Um, if you have too few, you're going to wait around a while before you can actually execute the model. Executing the model in this case means driving your car from your old apartment to your new apartment. So the key thing that you're trying to, you know, trade off here is, is your model waiting for your data loaders or are your data loaders waiting for your model? If you hire too many people, they're going to be really efficient, but they're going to bring the boxes out and they're waiting for the car to come back. This is a lot like what happens when you have, uh, you've invested a lot of resources into your data loader and not as many into, into your model. So this is kind of the trade-off that we're going to try to address with some concrete PyTorch examples. Okay, so um, there's some knobs you can tweak here. Uh, and this is going to provide kind of the easiest wins for speeding up your data loader. So first you have your batch size. Um, most of you have encountered this in some way already. It's how many images get processed in parallel by your model. Um, so GPUs are designed to do many small operations in parallel. And so to fully take advantage of that, you can do many image computations at once. Um, and so your batch size controls basically how many you feed through your model at once. Um, this affects training, like we've talked about. Um, 
that's the batch size that's used for gradient descent. But you can also adjust the batch size at inference time. So you can adjust how many images are being processed at one time during prediction as well. The next parameter that you can tweak is the input size, so the image size. Uh, you can increase your image size, but then you're not going to be able to fit as many of them in memory. Okay, so there's, a, there's also a speed accuracy trade-off here that we'll get to. And then finally, you can optimize uh, the number of data loader workers. Um, so I'm going to cover each of these kind of one by one, give some best practices for, for setting the values. So first is the batch size. Um, so this affects speed. Bigger batch size means that it takes you fewer iterations to get through your whole data set. So going through your data set once, that's an epoch. You've all seen this terminology by now, probably. You can get through the epoch in fewer steps if each batch is larger. Okay. That doesn't linearly increase your speed because it's also slower to process a bigger batch. So there's some diminishing returns here. But in general, if you bump up your batch size, you can go faster. Um, we were saying the other day that batch size can have an effect on your accuracy during training. Um, mostly it's in the extremes. If you have a very small batch size versus a very large batch size, the large batch size will give you better results. Um, it's important to note that during inference, there's no effect on the accuracy. If you increase the batch size, you're just predicting on those images. You could do that same way. That's because there's no backprop, right? Exactly, yeah. because there's no backward pass, there's no update. Yeah. Yeah. So the reason it affects training is because you're doing gradient descent on batches. And so you're sort of, you're finding the, um, the update that you should take with respect to the data in your batch. And so if you have a smaller batch, it's a bit noisier than if you have a larger batch. Now the average of updates that you need to make for each image in the batch is sort of a safer learning step to take. So yeah, the like, error is in one batch calculated on all of the errors of the images in one batch. Correct. Yeah, so in a batch, um, when you're training, you send one batch through the model at a time, you calculate the loss for those images, and then you take a step, you take a learning step. So um, how many people have looked at the inputs to their model and seen that it's this funny four-dimensional tensor? So um, it might be a review, but this has a pretty standard shape usually. The first dimension of this tensor is the batch size. So if you see that it's one comma something, 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 that means your batch size is one. Okay. The next is channels. If you're using normal RGB imagery, that's going to be three channels. And the next is going to be the image height and image width. This is just something to keep in mind. A lot of the time when you're tweaking your model, you can get tripped up by the batch dimension. Like if you think you're just messing with images, it turns out you're actually messing with batched images. And so just keep that first dimension in mind. So image size is a bit obvious uh, with the, you know, what the trade-off is here. Um, larger images take up more memory. So you can have four cute fish pictures in the same number of pixels as this one big cute fish picture. And the key thing here is there's a trade-off. So you have a fixed amount of GPU memory and you want to fit a batch of data in there. And so you can think of the cubes here as being your GPU memory. Uh, the x-axis is the image height. The uh, y-axis, I guess, is the image width, and the z-axis is the batch size. So there's different combinations of image size and batch size that will take up all of your GPU memory. And this is the trade-off that you have to try to balance. Does channel that matter here? Is it four-dimensional? Uh, I'm assuming that the, yeah, this image assumes that the channels are kind of just built into the dimensions, I guess. It, it is a 4D. This should be in 4D, right, but just curious. taking the channels out was the sim yeah. simplest uh, reduction to 3D. 
So how should you decide, you know, whether you use a big batch in small images or a small batch in big images? Uh, there's a trade-off here. Larger images, like we talked about the other day, can give you better accuracy. Um, there's usually diminishing returns here. So um, this is uh, a couple examples from a couple papers where they looked at this trade-off. So we start with the graph on the right. Uh, this, the x-axis is input resolution. The y-axis is accuracy. I mean, it's actually the area under the RFC curve, but we can think of it as accuracy. And so you see, like, increasing the input resolution from 50 to 300 gave them a really big accuracy boost. But after that, there wasn't much effect. Probably this is going to be true for most of you as well. Uh, and so you can just experiment to kind of find this point of diminishing returns and then stick with kind of the smallest size that gets you the accuracy that you need. Then you can bump up your batch size, you can improve the speed of your training, and you've maintained that accuracy that you're looking for. So how do you actually modify it? I think this is something that uh, most people have encountered, but just in case, um, these slides will be available for reference as well. Um, usually the image size is a parameter in the uh, input transforms. So usually you're doing some kind of resize operation on the way in. Uh, and so if you want to find the size of the image that actually hits your model, it's usually tucked away in your transforms. Um, the batch size, on the other hand, is in the data loader. So the standard PyTorch data loader has a batch size parameter, and you can tweak that. Um, if you're using something like YOLO or Open Soundscape or even the CT classifier uh, repo, you can also tweak these in the config files. Usually people, this is a common enough thing to tweak that people typically build it into their configuration files. And so usually if you tweak the batch size there, tweak the image size there, it will work out for you. Something you need to make sure of is uh, to change this for both training and inference. So this was a, a problem that we talked about the other day too. Sometimes there's inconsistencies and maybe there's like a different parameter in the config file for the inference image size. So just keep an eye out for that to make sure you're modifying the right thing. One question, because here you don't sampling the image and you know, after the bounding box for instance is predicted, it's again up sample to the original size of the image, right? Right. So, but in segmentation, we had then issues with this, you know, because the up sampling then produced like malformations in, this, in, the, in the maps. So you would what have to already initially resize your images, like your original data set to what would be your recommendation? avoid this type of problems because you know with and also to have precise maps you know yeah yeah so the question is um if you're doing segmentation if you're down sampling the image to put into the model and then up sampling again back to your original resolution you're going to have artifacts in your masks because they're predicted at a, at a lower resolution um yeah, you could. There's a couple ways to address it. You could just change the input size of your model to be the original image dimensions. It's also possible to add like another upsampling layer at the very end if you wanted to um, to get it back to the original resolution. So you can use like kind of an additional layer at the front and back to to downsize it and then re-upsize it. So we can we can go over that later. But would you have to go in the like the unit model thing and actually slot in two additional like you probably have to make it custom or whatever you call them. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, there's also like more standard sort of interpolation uh, approaches you could use, but maybe you still see the same artifacts. Okay. So, how do you pick the right values for you? Um, most people, I think, in here have seen NVIDIA SMI. So this lets you check how much of your GPU memory is being used. So if you just run NVIDIA SMI, you're going to see this window open up. Um, second column from, or I guess just this middle column says memory usage. And so you see how many megabytes out of how many meg megabytes you're using. Uh, and so you can just bump up your batch size, bump up your image size until you kind of max this out. Uh, like we said the other day, if you hit this CUDA out of memory error, that's okay. That just means you've hit the upper limit. 
you know, go back, set it a little bit lower, and you'll probably fit in there. The way that I actually like to do this is to open up two terminal windows. And in one of them, you can use this watch command. So watch dash N1 NVIDIA SMI will actually refresh NVIDIA SMI every one second. And so you can open up two terminal windows. And in one of them, you can watch NVIDIA SMI. And in the other one, you can run your training script with different parameters. So you can change the image size, change the batch size, and then watch what happens. See how close you get to that upper limit? Keep doing it so you get very close. Okay, so that's image size and batch size. So I'd recommend just trying some different values, see how much image size affects your accuracy. Okay, then find the lowest image size that gets you to where you want to be, and then maximize the batch size for that image size. So the next thing is the data loader workers. Um, this is also just built into PyTorch data loaders. Um, so it's a parameter called num workers that you can set. This is also usually in config files. So keep an eye out for it. This just uh, specifies how many CPU threads you can use for parallel data loading. Um, so a thread is like an independently running process. You can have a bunch of threads running in parallel, doing you know the same thing at the same time, but with different inputs. So if you have eight data loader workers, you have eight independent parallel threads each loading an image from disk and sending it to the GPU. So depending on your CPU resources and depending on your GPU resources, you might be bottlenecked by either your workers, which are trying to read these like hefty image files from disk, or you might be bottlenecked by the model trying to process the images. Uh, and so in practice, a reasonable starting value for your data loader workers is to look at your CPU cores, see how many you have, and try to put a data loader on each one, uh, a worker on each one. This is a little different right now because we're sharing machines. Um, so you can look at your uh, CPU count. That tells you how many cores you have. And just divide by the number of people in your group. So don't hog them all. Um, there's also diminishing returns here. Like I would start with two, see how that goes. Check four, check eight, check 16. Um, Usually you'll get speed ups by finding the optimal value, but there's there's diminishing returns between the absolute best value and the second best value. So in this course, everybody has about like 20, 22, uh, no, 24, 24 CPUs per GPU. Is there any value in not using all 24? Yeah, so the question is whether you should just max it out always. Um, there's, there's typically, so the, the problem there is that then the, um, the, the model becomes the bottleneck. So you have a bunch of data loaders waiting around for the model to finish the iteration to put the data on the GPU. And then you get this kind of weird stop and start thing. So some of them, as soon as the model's like, I'm ready, then some of those data loaders get to dump their data, but the other ones are still waiting around. Uh, and so in practice, it might not be slower than using, say, 8 or 16, but it might just hog more resources and not get you any additional speed. Like it hogs more RAM? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I see. Um, so, so if you're running inference and it's just on a laptop where there's not a GPU, if you set num workers, a model will be running on CPUs as well. Mm -hmm. And does that do a smart way to like distribute inference of the model across CPUs or the model will still always run on just one CPU, but data loaders could speed up the data loading process? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, if you're running your model on a CPU, it will also be on one core, I think, unless, unless there's a way to change that. But I, so you have multiple cores in your CPU by default. And you can use them for different things. And so if your model is on one, now you have your other cores to do parallel processing like the data loading. Okay, yeah. So you still could benefit from increasing the number of workers, even if you're running on CPU. And do you know rule of thumb, so if there's like eight cores in the CPU, you still need to leave some spare for like background processing on your computer or something? Yeah, so those, um, for that reason, it's nice to just test a few values and see what works best. Um, so typically like 
when you're launching this Python script to run your inference, that's going to be running on what's called the main thread. Okay, then it's probably loading your model onto a different or different thread, and then the data loader is on even other, you know, other ones. Okay, so yeah, generally you kind of want to leave one core for the main thread, at least one for the model, and then. Yeah, I mean, it's sort of like save this on your laptop as well. And, yeah. Um, do you need to leave like some free just for like other processes on the laptop? Like, if you want to like be using your laptop while you're running the model, then it's probably nice to do that. Okay. <laughs> Otherwise, it could, it could really slow it down. Yeah. Also, like, it'll start hissing at you. Like, <laughs> yeah, it tends to do that. If you run the model on CPU, it's going to be a lot slower on that actual like model step, and so like two or four workers is almost always going to keep up with you. Uh, yeah, yeah, totally. The other thing to note about the num workers parameter, if you use zero, that means that everything goes on the main thread. That's going to be slow, but it also uh, can help with debugging sometimes. If you have some weird thing that's happening in your data loader and it's just crashing and giving you a meaningless error message, changing to num workers equals zero will put it all just like in a normal Python process and you'll actually be able to see where it's breaking. It'll tell you like the right line. Um, so that could be like a nice debugging tool. Uh, and so for uh, for doing this, um, since this is more of a timing thing, so now you're messing with the num workers. That's not really going to change your memory consumption, at least on your GPU. That's dictated by your batch size and your image size. Now you're looking at how much does this improve the speed, improve the runtime of my training or inference code? Um, so Python has some built-in methods for doing this. There's a module called time. And so anywhere in your code, you can call time.time. .time, and it's going to give you the time in seconds since the epoch, which is this weird computer science thing. Um, if you haven't seen it before, it's this really bizarre number that you're going to get. 166058. That, that's an example of like last year's time since Epoch. So it's the number of seconds since like January 1971 or something like that. Um, but the absolute number is not important. You can use that to track when things happen. So you get time.time .time at the beginning of your script, you get time.time .time at the end of your script, and you subtract them and you see how many seconds it took you to do something. So that can help you time the individual components of your script. So you can time your data loader. You can time your model. You can time your post-processing by putting this time.time .time call before and after. But you're using GPUs, which are doing things asynchronously. You actually can't just use time.time. .time. You have to run this torch.cuda.synchronize commands before running time.time. .time. This is really important. If you don't do this, you're going to get weird values that are not correct. Um, so I recommend just writing a method like this. And anytime you would call time.time, .time, instead call time sync. Um, I added this to the CV for Ecology GitHub uh, under lecture 12. So you can just grab this code directly. It's built into the CT classifier repo in this, uh, or this is like a fork of the CT classifier that now has some timing stuff built in that you can check out. And so here's kind of uh, what I just described. So uh, this is what is now in this lecture 12 efficient models GitHub. So at the beginning of the training script, I initialized the data loader time, the model time, and the post processing time to zero. I call time dot or I call time sync before iterating over all of my data. And then I call it again right after the data loader step and add now minus last time to the data loader time. And then I do the same thing for the model before and after calling the model and the same for the post processing before and after. And then at the end of my training loop, I can see actually my data loader time in seconds was 21. My model time in seconds was 13. My post-processing time in seconds was 0 0.1. And so now I get an idea of the bottlenecks of my processing. Should I target my efforts on speeding up the data loader, speeding up the model, 
this is a really nice way to figure out what's actually taking a lot of time when you run your code. So speaking of models, that's the next thing that we're going to talk about speeding up. Uh, before we move on, does anybody have any questions about the data loading? Cool. Bjorn? Do the numbers tell me anything of like the time it takes for the data loader and the time it takes for the model? Should they be approximately the same? Should one be like double times the model? Um, or is it really just about, I try to reduce the time of my data loader and then the time of my data loader goes down? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't, I don't know if there's a rule of thumb for how long they should take in relation to each other, unless anybody has one that they use. So. Yeah, I mean, the quality kind of makes sense. So it, you have to be careful about how you time it, but PyTorch is smart enough to like do the data loading while your model is running on the GPU. Right, they're both happening at the same time. And so like, if loading one batch takes the same time as processing a batch on the GPU, then you, you actually, it's kind of like, if one's slower, that's the one you should load. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, if you can get them equal, that means that they're kind of going back and forth. Nobody's waiting on anybody else. I think so. So, um, these are the easy wins for speed with your model. The first is going to be the backbone size and design. So this is like the model architecture. We're going to do a little interlude on what's a CNN and what are the different components that you can size up and down. Um, then there's some other things like mixed precision, quantization, pruning, distillation. These are either just like freebies that you can use or more advanced topics to explore later. Um, the main one is, is going to be the model architecture. So. In summary of what's to come, to make your model more efficient, use a smaller model. It's kind of obvious, but we're going to talk about how you design a convolutional neural network and what actually makes these more or less efficient. Um, so how many people have come across like a picture like this? OK, is it really confusing? Yeah. yeah. Cool. <laughs> um, so. Where do we start? OK. Um, there's a way that these things are named. Usually the first part of the name, like this is a VGG-16. It's named that because the VGG research group invented it. And it has 16 convolutional layers. So this is like a common pattern. So you have like ResNet 50 has 50 layers. ResNet 101 has 101 layers. Um, YOLO's a bit weird. They have their own that they just call small, medium, and large. But if you dig into the configuration files, you'll see it actually defined by how many layers they have. Um, so what's a layer? Each of these um, little rectangles is like a convolutional layer. And so what do these actually do? Convolution is just a sliding window weighted average over an input. So the middle square here is the convolutional filter. Okay, this is one filter going over the input and creating the output. So the weights of the filter, aka the kernel, are multiplied by the window that it's looking at in the input to get the output. Is it just a dot product there, like element exactly. by element wise multiplication, then summed up to get the final number that's popped in the, the pink thing? Yes, exactly. It's a dot product. Does this make sense? Everybody can see how we get from those numbers to those numbers by doing element wise multiplications. Does the um, kernel always look the same, or is that sort of? No, so this is the important part. The kernels are learned. Okay. You start with random initializations, and your model's going to learn the best weights for each kernel to get you the output that you want. The filter or kernel or weights or synonym? Yes. Okay. The kernel set. Oh, sorry. So, <laughs> go ahead. No, the size, you set the size ahead of time, right? So it's three by three, and then. Yes. Okay. So I'll, I'll talk about that in a second, the different ways that you can tweak this. Yeah. So um, does like each filter, does it get good at like 
learning one sort of feature and then the more filters you have, the more robust your model can be. Yes, yeah, so I'll, I'll get to that in a sec. But yeah, the question is, does each filter kind of learn to kind of specialize in one thing? Generally, yeah. And so um, I'll get to this in a second also, but each convolutional layer is a collection of filters. So you don't just have one of these for each stage, you actually have a lot of them. And they can learn different things from each other. So for one, uh, for one filter, the things that you can tweak are the kernel size, like Chris asked. So this is a three by three kernel. You're passing this three by three window over the input. Um, and then you can also modify the stride, which is how big of a step this kernel takes between each, uh, each multiplication, essentially. So this has a stride of one because it's moving over to the right one. And then once it hits the end, it goes down one, just a stride of one. So um, this is a different way of looking at it. But so for example, you can see here that it reduces the spatial dimensions. The output is a smaller dimension than the input. This can be useful, but sometimes it's not. Sometimes because of your architecture design, you might not want to downsample when you go to the next layer. And so this is a different way of looking at the same thing. So here the light blue is the input, the kernel is the dark blue, and the output is now kind of floating above. So in the same way, uh, this is downsampling uh, the spatial resolution. Um, what's the stride of this model or of this filter? So you can avoid this downsampling thing by adding padding. And this is something that people do in practice. It seems like a bit of a hack, but it's really common. So you just add some empty values around the edges. Uh, you use a stride of one. And now you can see that the input and the output are the same spatial resolution. So they're, they're like NA cells around the edge, but it, it just deals with it and it doesn't screw up. There's different ways of doing it. like. Whether you fill it with an empty value or fill it with, you know, Zero. you mirror the value at the edge further out. Oh, okay. It's different things that people have tried. Um, so these are things that you don't really need to worry about. Other people worry a lot about them and have designed things like ResNets and YOLO with these considerations in mind, and they've sort of traded off these different uh, parameters that you can tweak to find things that work well. The important thing to know is that each convolutional layer has a bunch of filters. Okay, and each of those filters has a bunch of learned weights. Okay, so if you think about it, like, when the input first hits the model, this first layer is going from pixels to like, the first layer of intermediate features that it might want to learn. And so in practice, that ends up looking a lot like edges. Like the first layer of your model is sort of saying, where are the edges? Okay, it has a bunch of different filters. Each filter winds up specializing to like a different orientation of edge. Okay. Then the second layer is like, how do I build more semantic features from edges? It starts to build like corner detectors. So a lot of like the filters in your second layer of your neural network activate when they see corners. And each filter can kind of specialize um, to different orientations of corners and things like that. So as you go deeper in the network, you start combining features from the previous layers, and you get more and more semantic features as you go deeper. Okay. And this is all like things that people have observed. Like nothing was built into these networks to say the first layer is an edge detector, the second layer is a corner detector. These are just things that tend to be learned that become useful for processing your data. So, um, so what do you mean when you say semantic features? By semantic features, I mean, um, so if you think about the very end of your model, so you pass your image through the model, and just before you do the classification step, the vector of features there is like maybe 500 features long. Each of those is semantic in the sense that it refers like it probably represents some concept like wings on a bird or beak 
shape or something like that. It's, it's a higher level in a way, is what I mean by semantic. Where like low level would be edges and color values, high level would be like has wings or has wheels or something like that. So like some more specific feature based on your inputs. Yeah. Like like something that's less generalized. Yeah, exactly. Or, uh, yeah. This is one of the reasons that fine tuning is often like useful is because like a lot of the low level stuff is shared across like most tasks with similar types of data. So like it doesn't matter if you want to identify um, like molecular stuff or birds or guano, like things like edges are kind of generally useful like concepts and then the model in all of those very deep and sort of very complex and very nonlinear um, kind of features is sort of mapping together some of these lower level concepts and like putting them together into things that then are representative of higher level concepts at like a really base, like intuition based. Um, yeah. Just a comment to me, it's just fascinating how like, because there is in this convolutional areas, there's practically no instruction on what it should learn. It just because of the back propagation, it somehow first learns the edges, so the basic stuff, and then it goes into uh, this more semantic features, specifics to certain shapes. I just fascinated that somehow the complexity of these filters increases through the layers. How is this possible only because of this like uh, like uh, error, like it's being back propagated? Yeah. Lots and lots and lots of data. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of amazing though, right? It's yeah. like such a general principle. Yeah. There's so very like complex outputs in it. Yeah, just by optimizing for reducing the loss, yeah. it learns, you know, a sequence of steps to get there. It's, it's pretty cool. Back in the day, we used to like do all of this in a really handcrafted way. Like when I started yes. doing computer vision a while ago, it was like you would say, oh, I think it's going to be important to understand edges and shapes. And then you'd like build explicit tools to do those things and then map them together. And then now, and then we realized that actually any rules we came up with were somehow less flexible and less useful than letting it just learn from the data, assuming you have sufficient data, which is like a little annoying because you're like, but all my handcrafted, beautiful, mathematically principled things are not better than this brute force approach. But there still is a lot of um, kind of care that comes into the way that these things are defined. So I'm curious because uh, does it mean that it's inherited in the convolutional operation that the, that always you pick edges, which is like a texture of the image property? Um, or do you pick something else as well? Like, are we limited by the dictatorship? Of edges you know what i mean and it's that would be a thing that is learned by those particular filters so there's nothing like hard coded in there that says this needs to pick up edges or, or not and remember too that the um only that first layer is seeing the actual pixels in the image so the layers after that are running this convolution on the inputs from the previous step so it kind of like gets out of this raw RGB visual space very quickly. And it does this for the three channels. It picks on edges on the three channels in parallel. Yeah, so um, if you have colors. Yeah. So if you have multiple channels, here this convolution is actually doing it for all the channels together. So it's, it's actually like a 3D operation. This is like a simplification where we're just looking at one channel, but it will do. Uh, so you end up with one output, not with three outputs. Yes. Okay. But you end up with one output per, per filter. filter, and then you might have 50 filters. Okay. Yeah. And so they all look at the same input with different learned weights. By, by that, I mean all the new, all the filters in your layer that you're currently in. Each one independently looks at the input, does a convolution, and then has an output. So in the other image on the next slide, you may have like 50 filters in your first layer, right? And each filter is going over the raw image, and then you wind up with uh, like um, 50 kind of slices, essentially. Mm -hmm. And then what's this ReLU pooling thing? That, that I keep seeing that coming up. I'll get to that in a sec. Oh. Yeah, yeah. 
Now you've had a question for a while. Yeah, um, I'm curious, just like you say that the um, this kind of tendency for progression as you progress through the convolution layers to get from these very sort of basic features to more complex representations is observed. Like, I'm just curious, how, how are people observing that? Is that through like a grad camp type of process? Yeah, or? that's one way that you can do it. Yeah, you, you measure like, uh, for some inputs, you measure the activation of the particular filter uh, on that input, if that makes sense. So if you just pass like an image of an edge through the model, like oriented in some direction, you would see that the filter that's you know specialized toward that orientation of edge would fire really uh, strongly. Okay, interesting. Yeah. Yeah, we can look at some examples later too. There's some cool visualizations there. I'll just take one more. Oh, sorry. Uh, sorry. Uh, so that, sorry, in the, um, the diagram that's really stretched out is mm -hmm. the uh, dimension that's expanding. Is that the number of filters per layer? That's the number of layers, and I'll get to that on like the next slide. So is there any indication how many filters there are per layer yes. that's built into the no. architecture? No, that's something you can change as well. Um, and I'll show you how to find that value. Yeah. Um, I'm going to. Go to the next slide and then take more questions after. That's that's cool. Um, okay, so the number of filters we talked about. This is also sometimes called the width. Um, spatial resolution we already talked about, and then so nonlinearities and pooling are other things that you're going to see when you dig into these models. Um, pooling is a way of reducing uh, either the spatial dimension or the the width without having to do a convolution. And then nonlinearities are typically inserted between the uh, convolutional layers. Um, and that's just something that helps the network learn. So it's kind of like a standard thing that people use. So you'll probably see like ReLU's uh, or other types of activation functions after each layer. You don't have to worry about modifying those, but, uh, but it is important for the network to learn. So going back to this BGG diagram, um, where are all these things that we talked about? So kind of what Michael was getting at, the depth, the number of layers is the depth. So that's like left of this image to the right of the image. Each rectangular block is a layer, and that's the number of depth. So there's 16 there. And then when you see people um, write out the dimensions of each layer. So for example, this sort of uh, last convolutional layer is 7 by 7 by 512. What that means is the spatial resolution there is seven by seven. And there's 512 filters, so that's the width. And so typically early on, you're not reducing the spatial dimensions much yet, but you have fewer filters. So you have higher spatial resolution, but less filters. And then as you get deeper, you get lower spatial resolution, but more filters. It's common. Um, it's important also to remember that you're reducing the spatial dimensions within these convolutional layers, that seven by seven is a representation of the image. And so if you think about a seven by seven grid, now each of those cells has to represent quite a large area of this input image. Um, and so you can kind of connect that to what we were talking about with the trade-offs between image size and accuracy. If you have a really small object, by the time it gets to this seven by seven layer, it's represented by a single entry in that layer. Maybe, you know, maybe it's in that entry with a bunch of other stuff around it. So um, if you increase the input spatial dimensions, then these later layers are also gonna have usually a higher spatial resolution. So that's a way that you can kind of learn more from larger inputs. But that's also why when you increase the input resolution, it massively increases the entire size of the model yeah. in some cases. Um, so to me, that seems somewhat counterintuitive because you've got less space from which to learn, but you're adding more filters that are doing learning. Like if you've got seven by seven, that's um, like, yeah, it's just not as many pixels compared to if you had this huge image and there might be all these tiny things you want to look for so, so there's nothing that says that the ma a massive contribution from that large area is really only coming from a very small part of that large area 
So when you look at like GradCam, for example, you can see like the, the major contribution or a lot of like the, the high values that are passing through the network might only be coming from a small part of that region. So the model can still kind of focus in a way. Um, and so it, it doesn't necessarily mean that at the end, this seven by seven thing is like, it's this whole region and everything's being considered equally. Mm. It can it can really be only kind of taking the majority of the weights and pulling them through. If a lot of that background area kind of gets set close to zero in the weights condition on this given image, like then it's still focusing. It, it, so once you get further on in the network, it's it's much more difficult to like reason explicitly spatially about um, what's going on. Yeah, and because each each convolutional layer is like a weighted sum of features from the previous layer, and each filter can learn a different weighted sum of features, so they can learn to pay attention to different things. So all so by the time you get to seven by seven, you have five hundred twelve different filters that have each learned how to weight the features from the previous five hundred twelve filters in a different way, and so you get these really like you know highly interactive features that in some way, like for this image, this would be like a, an image classification problem. So you just want to have one output for this image. So maybe each filter learns to actually pay attention to a different part with a different uh, importance level. Or yeah, like that. I guess I can't complete the math in my head, but that basically some by some is like you've got 49 pixels. It seems like you just run out of combinations of how you could do those, but I guess 512 isn't actually close to that number. Yeah, and this is this is kind of what I meant by also the features are more semantic because they capture like the extracted features from the previous layer, which captures also the extracted features from the previous layer, and so they get more and more complex as you go through the network. So basically, the thing you're getting out in the end is maybe this one by one by forty ninety six, or this one by one by whatever like feature embedding, and that embedding every single one of those dimensions is capturing you know different capacity, and so it's really just a clever way to try to force the model to actually pay attention to what's important, right? You're trying to build a representative lower dimensional feature. And so the point is actually that you're trying to figure out clever ways to compress the representation. Okay. Yeah, it's no longer pixels. I think you need yeah. to like let go of the yeah. concept of it being seven by seven pixels. It's like seven by seven that's actually related to a much larger patch. Like the sentences almost. almost. Yeah. yeah, like descriptions, like paragraphs. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. in the beginning, you also like target as just inside lower level things. So we don't need as many filters. We don't need as much expressive power. <laughs> All right, this is clearly. I'm um, really. We talked yeah. about whether or not we should include this in this lecture, and I think it is a nice. I'm glad that we got into it. Let's let Justin get through the rest of his material. <laughs> <laughs> quite a long interlude. Okay, the, the whole point of this was that. Um, so that you can recognize these, um, term, these terms when you see them in your model. So you're going to see things like layer width, layer depth, um, max pooling, ReLU, things like that. Just know that these are like designs that people have thought a lot about and have really optimized. And so you can kind of pick the small ones and the large ones or you know, optimize for the size without having to think of these different ways that you can vary uh, the width and the depth and everything. Um, so this is from the Efficient Net paper, uh, where they did a pretty in-depth study about this, where they looked at, uh, so the x-axis of all these graphs are the floating point operations. So that's how many matrix multiplications you have to do to run an image through the model, higher and slower. And so the, the y-axis is the accuracy. And so they looked independently at network width, network depth, and input resolution. And they found basically the optimal scaling factors to increase the size of the model from quote unquote small to quote unquote large. Okay, so typically if you look at like a ResNet or an efficient net or something else, you can just pick their default settings for small, medium, large, or you know, ResNet 18, ResNet 50, ResNet 101, things like that. Um, you don't have to figure it out yourself. So then you still have to choose uh, which backbone to use. And so a lot of the time you're going to run into graphs that look like this, and they're a bit scary looking when you first see them, especially if they 
put a table in the middle of the plot. It's a bizarre <laughs> use of my choice. Um, typically, the, the number of parameters or the speed, some indication of efficiency or speed is going to be on the x-axis. Typically, higher means slower, although you want to be careful and, and make sure you know what it is they're plotting exactly. But often, higher is slower on the x-axis, and higher is more accurate on the y-axis. Okay, so this is from the efficient net paper. They did this exact thing. This is from YOLO v5. They do the exact same thing. Basically here, if you go up and to the left, that means you're more efficient and you're more accurate. So typically they plot these things to show that their model is better in the up and to the left direction. Right, and so you can kind of estimate your trade-offs here. Like if you look at the, the topmost arc, these are the different sizes of the efficient net model. So B, you know, B0 is the smallest. And you can see if you go from B0 to B4, you gain a lot of accuracy and you don't make the model that much slower. But getting from B6 to B7 is a lot of efficiency loss for not that much more accuracy. And so you need to kind of evaluate these trade-offs for your problem. You know, can you afford being that much slower for a couple percent more accuracy? Does that actually help you? And so some examples of efficient architectures, just so you know what to look for. And honestly, most of you are already using these. I think most people started with a fairly lightweight model so that they could iterate more quickly. So for classification, you could use a ResNet 18, an efficient net B0, or a mobile net. These are kind of the smaller versions of these models. Um, for object detection, you can use a single stage model, which I think everybody is. Those tend to be faster. So single stage model would be like a YOLO or an SSD. Uh, and you can use the nano size or the small size, or sometimes you can specify the backbone to actually be one of these smaller backbones like ResNet 18. Similar for segmentation, you can use a unit with a ResNet 18. So it's not that exciting. Just pick a small backbone and you're going to wind up with a more efficient network. And then you can analyze the accuracy of that versus a larger model and kind of you have your trade off there. So a couple more speed accuracy trade-offs you could consider. Um, an ensemble of models is when you run the same data through multiple models, and then you average their predictions. Um, so in practice, this can give you a nice accuracy boost. So I'm sure you've all noticed that when you train your model with the same parameters, you don't necessarily wind up with the exact same performance. And it's because of the randomness of the training process, you wind up with two models that get to similar conclusions for different reasons. So if you think of having those two models as like a committee of experts that you're asking about your problem, the average of their predictions is likely to be better than any individual one. Okay, there's obviously a slowdown here because now you have to run it through, you have to run your data through two models. But often running your data through two small models is actually faster than running it through one big model and sometimes even better accuracy. So it's something to consider. Um, yes. I'm, I'm just wondering, you'd use different architectures, right? You could, but you don't have to. Okay, because if you use different architecture, doesn't that mean like that an average doesn't really work because they might be really different in their structure or parameters or learning rate or? So you would do an average of their outputs. So like if each model gives you, you know, a, a vector of confidences for each class, you could average the two vectors. You could also just take, you know, the highest confidence class from either one or something like that. There's sort of different ways that you can do this average prediction at the end to account for the fact that you might have different architectures or different types of outputs. And if it was the same model, would that just be everything exactly the same and you average over different runs or? I don't know, you'd add augmentation or so that you know it proves it or? Yeah, there's many different things you could do. Think of it like a random forest. A lot of you are kind of familiar with the concept of a random forest. That's the exact same model, basically with different parameters. And then you're combining a bunch of them and you get a better result than any individual one. You can basically construct something that, you know, at face value looks a little bit like a random forest, but now you're, you just have maybe five different ResNet 18s that are sort of instantiated with different parameters and thus have learned slightly different things. So it has, uh, 
a question on this from someone I was doing before where, say, like you compute the spectrogram at the start of audio processing, and that's quite costly, and it could benefit to compute different types of spectrograms. Yeah. So in that case, you might still suffer from like that taking longer because you've got to do basically like I'm saying, is this only quicker if you use the same starting data point? Yeah. So there's no, there's no like hard and fast rule. So each problem is going to have its own kind of constraints like that. Um, and you'll have to kind of empirically see whether it makes sense to, to use something like this. So yeah, if it takes you longer to generate two different versions of the data to pass into your two different models, that's something else to consider here. Um, yeah, the, the point is more so that these are things that tend to improve accuracy at the cost of being less efficient, but there might be different ways that you can configure it to, um, you know, improve accuracy with less cost to your speed. So another way that you can do an ensemble type approach is called cascading. So instead of always running through the, through the two different models, you can actually run your data through one model, check to see if you get a confident prediction, and if not, then run it through your second model and average the predictions. And so there's been some interesting work here that actually shows you can get very accurate results faster with uh, an ensemble or a cascade of small models compared to just one giant model. Um, and so it's just, it's another dimension of speed accuracy trade-offs that you can explore once you have your model working. You could also think of this as a, a like that, is the model confident enough, send it to a bigger model. I mean, another version of that is, is the model confident enough, send it to a human, which is just another version of a model, and that has some cost. But potentially, you can get a better speed accuracy trade-off, where now you're just like using a human brain as like part of your system. Mm -hmm. So like that cascade, it doesn't always just need to be machine learning. But it's more like the systemic approach to getting the answer. Mm -hmm. right. I think it's another comment, um, Justin, is that these curves typically don't intersect. So if the curve starts above, stays above. Mm -hmm. So a, a soft lesson to learn here is that if people are testing different architectures, they might as well do it in a small format so that they do it fast. Mm -hmm. They get the first idea, and then they go for the big guns experiment on just the top two. But, uh, yeah, it's an interesting point. Yeah. yeah. It's looking like from this chart that um, the cascades always outperform the ensembles. Is there ever a reason to do the, not like an ensemble as opposed to a cascade configuration? Um, implementation effort. So an ensemble is going to be easier to implement. Um, cascade is more code that you have to write. Um, yeah. These remember that all these points are kind of like the optimal version of each of these. So if you have to optimize hyperparameters for five models, that's now a bunch more effort. Like it doesn't somehow there's kind of a dimension that's not captured here that isn't just like flops when running it. It's like like human effort of flops or development time is not captured here. More complex things take more development time. Yeah, and just because the curves look like this for an efficient net on ImageNet doesn't mean that they're going to look like that for your model and your data. So you always have to kind of test these trade-offs yourself. So does anyone want to complain about this plot in any way? <laughs> <Like you do>. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so if you have two complaint, complaints, I mean, just two, two things to watch for. Uh, it's you don't see confidence intervals on those points, right? So it sounds like they selected a specific test set and training set and ran all of these experiments on those. And so you could ask ask your question, ask a question: What would have happened had they chosen a different split of the data? Would the curves have switched uh, order? <clears throat> or would it have just barely wiggled a little bit? And so to me, this plot is okay, but uh, without having run at least three experiments where we use different splits, we'll see how thick uh, an area of uncertainty you get. I wouldn't necessarily go for it. Another thing is, <clears throat> something I tell my students always, that it's plotted all wrong because <clears throat> increments in uh, 
So what you're looking for is low error rate, right? So if you are uh, having an increment of 1% from 80 to 81, or from 70 to 71, but you reduce your error by 3%. If you have an increment from 90 to 91, you reduce your error by 10%. So it's hugely different. Mm -hmm. So the real way to, the best way to plot this would be error, namely one minus accuracy on the y-axis mm -hmm. and flops and do it in log log scale because then you see what is the trade-off in terms of proportions. If you're willing to spend 50% more, what percent gain in error rate do you get? And that's really how the human mind reasons and how you allocate resources. You know, it's a difference between doubling or halving. It's not one more dollar. If you have to pay one dollar for an ice cream and somebody says, no, it costs two dollars, it's a big shock. But it's, if you have to pay $30,000 for a car and somebody says one more dollar, you say, okay, so be it, no problem, right? So it's, it's a percent increase or decrease that matters. And you don't see these things in this kind of plot, which is a little bit of a shame. So one other thing you can do, I have to use your imagination because my image didn't make it in here. So instead of ensembling models, you can ensemble data augmentations. It's called test time augmentation. So you can pass in three differently augmented versions of your input data to your model. So something you might try is increasing the brightness in a couple different ways or something. If you have, if you know that dark images are hard for your model, you know, try different augmentations pass the image through your model multiple different times and then compute the average of its predictions. So again, this might improve your performance at the cost of speed. So you just have to kind of try and see if the trade-off is working. I'm really curious if anyone who anyone does this in practice. Mm -hmm. I like this is a really interesting idea. Um so so one of the like with camera traps, like often the model's really bad at dark images. And there's been efforts to try to come up with like nice heuristic, like automated, like, oh, I, I'm going to have something that's going to figure out what's the right combination of like contrast and brightness like adjustment, some sort of normalization that works sort of in a standard way across the board and like always gives you an image that's then the easiest to predict on. Those are usually pretty intensive. It's like slightly a hack, but like you can just try some different stuff and maybe one of them, the model's way more confident and then use it. Yeah, um, that's like pre-processing versus like giving different versions. No, 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 that's what I'm saying. Like, yeah. so yeah, like really carefully curated pre-processing that has parameters that might change when you go to different locations or changes thing changes, that's, like, that's a bit more brittle. Like this is kind of like a hack to get around that where now you just like run some different stuff and basically use the model's own confidence as like a, a, a form of usefulness. Mm -hmm. um, we have found that this helps sometimes with camera trap data. We often don't use it in practice. And I don't think that's like for a good, I think it's just like, oh, it's like slightly more complex, slightly more expensive. The, the cost benefit trade-offs, like, I don't know, may, maybe it would be worth investing the time to like really do this properly in something like Wildlife Insights. But if you're running this now over millions of images, running every image six times through the model becomes like that trade-off becomes more expensive. So. Like, I think that one of the reasons I don't often do this in practice is because it's much more expensive. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think definitely in papers, people do it often and show like they get a couple percent improvement. Um, a common yeah, one is like- Instead of an ensemble six model. Like, yeah, exactly. Better use of six times. Yeah, and it's kind of just like, yeah, try to figure out, like actually test this stuff. But I mean, if it is truly the case that like, if you take a, a really dark image and you set it through six different models and basically it's kind of hard for all of them and then you like just get the right combination of brightness and contrast adjustment that makes it easier for a human maybe it'll also be easier for the model so it, it is like a trade-off and it kind of depends on your input data and the quality issues you have um and it's and it's cumbersome like if has anybody here looked at kaggle it's like a machine learning competition website if you look at the winning submissions for CAO competitions, it's usually an ensemble of like 10 different models with a bunch of different test time augmentation because they're competing for like 0.01% on the test set. So they don't, they have no speed accuracy trade-off considerations. They are just pure, like throw the kitchen sink at it and see what we can get. But that's not all that, you know, that's not practical for deployment. And that's why a lot of the winning models from CAO competitions don't actually get used 
I'm curious if in Kaggle, if the people who uh, host the competition, have like whatever, sub submit challenges or problems for people to solve, is there an opportunity in Kaggle to be like, this is the hardware I'm ultimately going to be running it on, this is like the sort of whatever power envelope we're operating within and that kind of thing? Yeah, some people have restrictions like you have to submit a single model mm -hmm. um, or you have to submit code and it has to run under some processing time on our machine. Things like that. So the trade-off is like the difference between having people submit predictions, which it doesn't really matter what they're doing, it's like infinitely flexible, or having them submit model weights or having them submit code. And as soon as people are submitting model weights or code, then the people running the competition then need to actually be doing all of the inference on their own machines. So it becomes a much harder, a much more computationally intensive thing to run. Um, there are uh, some examples of non-Kaggle non competitions that explicitly have submitted code. I think driven data is one of yeah. them. And, and those, like to run a competition on driven data, their starting rates are like around 20 grand. Um, Kaggle also charges like for the featured competitions. Like there's, there's costs that, anyway, yeah. It, it's harder to run a competition if someone's submitting code. And it ends up really restricting what people can do because you end up having to restrict to like specific machine learning libraries or specific versions of the world. A really common test time augmentation for ImageNet that people just figured out was a bit of a it was like a bit of a hack to get better performance on ImageNet test data is center cropping because most of the ImageNet data, like the object is in the middle. And so you can actually just remove some of the confusion by just center cropping the test data. And most ImageNet performance, like they just do by default, they just center crop all the test data. This is a totally garbage thing to do for most of our data, right? Because we don't have well-centered stuff. <laughs> and the more complex version of that that people also use is called multi-crop, where they just take five different crops of the image, pass them all through average the results yes so how is this different than the augmentation that we're already doing so the augmentation that you're using right now is just during training oh. so probably your code base doesn't augment at inference time right except okay. for like resizing and maybe cropping okay I yeah. don't, that didn't quite yeah, land yeah. Until now. Totally. Got yeah, it. because I mean, you're you're using augmentation during training as like a regularization thing, where you're trying to make you're trying to give your model in some cases more difficult data to make it better. But at inference time, you want to make it easy mode if you can. Just give it the raw data right. if that's the easiest thing to predict on. But if you actually have like crap data that's really dark, then maybe you want to brighten it or whatever. Maybe. maybe. And like, there's often like, you know, you can, you can test this for yourself. Use Photoshop. Yeah. Like, like Cicely, use Photoshop and like make the image really easy for you to ID and then send it through your model and it might get better performance, but then it is really hard to build something that will automatically get the best input. Mm -hmm. That's like not brittle to change. I would just flag that if anybody's using that CT classifier repo uh, and using the same data loader you're using for the training script as you are in your inference script, it is not, it is doing those augmentations out of the box for your inference. So you don't have to make sure it's done. Oh, that's good to know. Do that. Yeah. CT classifier didn't have a predict script built in. So if you just use the data loader, uh, it will have. Oh, I, I thought we, we spend the, we send the split variable and then according to if it's valid or test, then it doesn't do the so Oh, okay. No, it did. I, I think that that might be the intended use, but I did recently help someone set that up, which means it probably wasn't yeah, ready for I thought there weren't any default augmentations. It was just resize, yeah. And just resize. An answer, right. And, and, and resize, it resize is a, is a pre-processing thing you actually have to do, yeah. right? right? At test time, no matter what, because your model's expecting a certain input size right. and you give it something else, it'll just crash. Yeah. Right. yeah. Actually, real quick, we're on this because I was I realized last night, maybe other people have figured already, but there, there didn't seem like there was a normalization augmentation going on. I, I kind of there isn't a CT classifier, and I think it might help a lot. Um, yeah. And that's who, who are we doing this with? Chris. Chris. Um, Call, no, no, Venetius. Venetius. Yeah. You can talk to Venetius. He's been working on it. Cool. <laughs> okay, I'm just going to cover the last couple slides pretty quickly because we're pretty over time. Um, the last ones are just okay. The first one is a freebie. Um, you don't really need to know what this is. It's called mixed precision, and basically it just tells your model 
to use uh, lower precision data in order to be faster. And by precision, I mean you don't have to represent every number with 32 ones and zeros. You can represent it with 16 ones and zeros and achieve the exact same performance. And you can use this regardless of whether your model was trained with 32-bit or 16-bit precision. Um, it's all built into PyTorch now. Just look for mixed precision. Um, there's some very standard boilerplate to enable it. I think YOLO just has it as a config variable. Um, if you check out this GitHub repo, Lecture 12 Efficient Models, um, you can see how to add it to CT Classifier. It's just a few lines of code, boilerplate, it'll work. So basically what that will do is make it so your data and your model take up half the space that they did before in GPU memory. So you can double your batch size for free. Mr. Training and or inference? Training and inference, yeah. Does that have a big accuracy trade-off? It has basically negligible not. accuracy trade-off. It turns out that basically we were keeping way more decimal places in these numbers in machine learning than we really needed to. And so they came up with these clever ways to like reduce the precision of the values, but in a way that doesn't really seem to affect the performance very much. Yeah. And note that this only works on particular GPUs. The ones that we have on the cluster, it works. Um, but later on, when you're deploying models, you should check to make sure that the uh, mixed precision works on that architecture. On the hardware. On the hardware architecture, yeah. Um, more advanced topics that I wouldn't recommend doing during the summer school, but you could look into later if you really want to keep speeding up your models. So the first is more advanced quantization. So going from 32-bit uh, inputs to 16-bit inputs is quantization. Um, you can go further and get that down to just using integers, You're just using 8-bit numbers to represent your model weights. This does have an effect on accuracy, and it's more intensive to do. Um, so I'd only recommend it if you really want to deploy on like a CPU or a really tiny edge device or something. Like a cell phone. Like a cell phone, yeah, exactly. The other thing you can do is called model pruning. So this is where you look at the actual weights of your model. So your model is probably like 25 million plus parameters. You can look at those and decide which ones are most useful and which ones are less useful. And you can actually just delete the ones that are less useful. This will have some effect on your accuracy, and that's something that you can tune as well. So you can see, you know, if I delete 5% of my parameters, this is the effect on accuracy and speed. If I delete 10%, this is the effect on accuracy and speed. So there's a trade-off. There's almost always a trade-off. I heard of dropout. How is this different from that? Dropout is a training uh, training time way of basically doing this. So during training, you would block out certain connections. And the reason that, so dropout is an example of regularization during training. And the value it gives is it basically tries to force your model to use all of the model's capacity. So like your model might just learn to use a few pathways and have a lot of the other ones kind of go to zero. And then you have what's called like a vanishing gradient where basically like then those kind of just disappear from use. Like they can't be sort of relearned to be useful once they've gone to zero. You use something like dropout, which is probably enabled. It's like enabled in many of these architectures by default. It just like only gives your model some subset of the weights to work with for any given image that goes in. And as a result, it's sort of forced to learn not to kind of put all its eggs in one or two baskets. It has to like diversify. <laughs> The last advanced trick you can look into is called knowledge distillation. So this is where you take a big model and you train a small model to mimic it in some way. Um, I'm actually not sure if on the size of data that most of us work with, if this works very well. So typically you'll do this when you have a giant collection of data. You run it through the big model and you have the small model mimic the outputs of the large one. Um, if you have a small data set, it might not work that well, but it could be worth experimenting. Okay, and then just to close out, um, this was the, a case study from a project that I worked on with Sarah and Pietro and Suzanne. Um, we used the things that we covered in this lecture to go from eight frames per second with our model to 120. Uh, so it actually works to use these things. So first we just used a faster GPU that gave us a nice bump. Then we added mixed precision to get from 16 to 28 frames per second. 
Then we optimized our data loader workers to get a little bit more of a boost. And then we did a speed accuracy trade-off with our different sized YOLO models to keep bumping that down while only losing around 1% accuracy. And we got to 120 frames per second with our model that used to be slow. So you can get this too. So what is RSTL here? That's a custom data loader that we built for our video format, uh, which is it's called RS format. So if you have a weird data format, that can also help you speed things up if you write a custom loader for it. So like the whole like writing, taking a wave file for audio, turning it into a spectrogram, saving that spectrogram off somewhere, then loading that spectrum, like that's really slow. So a custom data loader, like what we were doing before, which was really slow, but easy was we were taking sonar, turning it into images, saving the images, and then like taking the image, to sonar video and turning it into frame-wise images and taking those images at random and training a model on them. This was very slow. So Justin was like, put it all end to end. Yeah. Yep. OK, cool. Um, thanks, everyone. If you have more questions, feel free to come talk. To awesome. Um, we have like a sort of a bit of official 